want to get uh, going with our uh, our speakers for today, but let me just uh, let me just say a little bit about the Center for Christian Thought here at Biodiversity. Um, the Center for Christian Thought uh, exists to connect Christian scholarship to the church and to the academy. Oftentimes, uh, there's good work being done by Christian scholars all over the world, and yet oftentimes that scholarship doesn't find its way uh, into our local churches. And so one of the things we want to try to do is connect uh, uh, Christian scholars and and the ideas uh, percolating in the academy uh, with what's going on in the life of the church and that's and that's part of the purpose of this event uh, today so for those of you who have come uh, from uh, local churches and who uh, work and serve in local congregations uh, thank you for coming and we hope that uh, the, the thoughts that are shared in events like this will uh, st stir you and stimulate you and and we want to be a resource to you and one of the things that you might want to check out is our is our website uh, at, at uh, the Biola Center for Christian Thought website, uh, because on that website we house a lot of videos and uh, various other resources that are really intended to uh, try to uh, bring, again, uh, leading uh, scholarly ideas and, and put them in formats that, that are accessible and understandable uh, that would be of importance to uh, you and your, your ministry work. Last year our theme was Neuroscience and the Soul, so we have a whole slew of stuff up on our website about Neuroscience and the Soul and uh, the role of the brain brain in, in change uh, and various other topics like that. This year our theme is uh, psychology and spiritual formation. So we're focusing together on um, what, what insights uh, does uh, psychological theory and practice have on the way of spiritual transformation uh, in Christ. And uh, so if you come up to the center space, which you are welcome to do at some point in time, maybe later today if you, if you can. I, that, wasn't an official announcement, so I probably wasn't supposed to invite you up, but you can. If you come up to the center space, what you'll find is you'll find a lot of nice offices and a big uh, table in the middle. And what we do is uh, we, we bring uh, visiting scholars from other universities to spend up to a semester, uh, sometimes up to a year here at Biola University as, as scholars in residence. And then we also release uh, Biola faculty from some of their teaching. So they join the, the group of fellows around the round table. And we gather together on a, on a weekly basis to discuss uh, each other's work and and um, and the the topics under uh, consideration and, and again this this semester and next semester our theme is psychology and spiritual formation uh, which uh, leads me to um, our speakers for today who are two uh, folks who are coming to visit with our fellows and we also wanted to bring them uh, to you uh, dr. James Houston and dr. Bruce Hindmarsh before I introduce them though let me mention that if you haven't heard already tonight uh, dr. Hindmarsh Marsh and Houston will be uh, here on campus delivering a public lecture in Calvary Chapel at 7 p.m. entitled Past Watchful Dragons Learning Spiritual Formation uh, from C.S. Lewis. And, and the interesting note about that is uh, Dr. Houston uh, knew C.S. Lewis, so um, he's going to be um, giving some uh, anecdotes from his own experience with Lewis, and uh, Dr. Hindmarsh will um, be interviewing him largely in that time. So that should be a very um, informative and interesting event. So if you're not able to make it, please uh, pass the word on to others. Uh, also, just something to make note of is uh, we do have a uh, conference coming up on January 31st to February 1st. This is what we call the Table Conference, and our theme is Mind Your Heart. Um, again, uh, working on the, the theme of psychology and spiritual formation. Uh, folks at that conference will be uh, some of the folks at that conference. We have Dr. Everett Worthington from Virginia Commonwealth University, Dr. John Coe from here uh, at Talbot Biola, uh, C. Stephen Evans from Baylor, Todd Hall, Jeffrey Schwartz, and, uh, and ma many others. So be looking for that conference. I think it's going to be uh, a very uh, good one. Um, so I think I will introduce uh, Dr. Houston first, and I was thinking of introducing him uh, this way and, and how it's going to work. So I'll introduce Dr. Houston and then uh, Dr. Heinmarsh, and then uh, Dr. Heinmarsh will come up first, and then he'll bring up Dr. Houston. So uh, before there, yeah, it's very complex. <laughs> At the Center for Christian Thought, we, we think about the complexities of these. So I was going to say this about Dr. Houston, so I think I will. Before there was Dallas Willard, or Richard Foster, or Eugene Peterson, or Marva Don, or uh, Brennan Manning, or numerous others, there was James Houston. And that's not just to say that Jim was born before all those people, that's true, I think, as well. But, but Jim has been talking about the need and nature 
of spiritual formation within the evangelical context for a long, long time, and long before many others uh, had, had picked up on that theme. And uh, uh, Bruce was mentioning that Jim has been a bit of a prophet in, in many categories, or I think that was my term, so I won't put the prophet term on you, but, but uh, a bit of a prophet in many categories. And certainly he was uh, seeing the need for a deeper uh, spirituality, particularly in the conservative Christian church, uh, many decades ago. When I was a student here at Talbot in the 1990s, there was a group of us, some of them are here today, who got together and, and we decided we wanted to hear more about this, uh, these new ideas in spiritual formation. And so we put together a conference uh, that we called The Journey which in the early 1990s, that wasn't an overused uh, term yet. In fact, it was, it was a bit edgy, the journey. People didn't uh, think of Christianity as a journey. It was more a download of information or something like that. And uh, so we put together this conference and we invited folks like Dallas Willard and Brennan Manning and we asked around and we said, so, so who's kind of the grandfather of the spiritual formation kind of movement that was just coming to be? And, and time and time again, uh, people mentioned the name of Jim Houston. And that was over 20 years ago. And even then, Jim, you were thought to be the grandfather of the uh, spiritual formation movement. Jim was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1922, was a university lecturer in cultural and historical geography at the University of Oxford from 1947 uh, into the 1970s. Jim immigrated with his wife Rita to North America and their four children uh, in 1969, and he was one of the founders of Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, where he has held the positions of principal, chancellor, professor of spiritual theology, and then he was endowed in 1991 as the Board of Governors Professor of Spiritual Theology. Jim's published uh, numerous books and articles in Christian spirituality. He's edited numerous classics of Christian spirituality. Some of the recent books that Jim has offered are The Mentored Life, Joyful Exiles. Uh, most recently, I think, uh, a book he co-authored, uh, A Vision for the Aging Church, Renewing Ministry for and by Seniors. Jim and his wife, Rita, have four children, nine grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. Is that up to date? Six great-grandchildren, so. So uh, Jim is a very wise uh, figure, as you'll soon see. Um, Bruce Hindmarsh uh, has big shoes to fill because Bruce uh, now inhabits the James M. Houston Professorship of Spiritual Theology at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, Bruce was born in Win Winnipeg, Manitoba sometime after 1922. I'm not quite sure when, but it was <laughs> more recent than that. Uh, he too took a, uh, his uh, training at Oxford University getting a DPhil degree. Uh, from 1995 to 1997, he was a research fellow at Christ Church, uh, Oxford. Uh, inhabiting the same stones as uh, John Locke and the Wesleys and others. He has since published and spoken widely to international audiences on the history of uh, British evangelicalism and spiritual theology more generally. His articles appeared in respected uh, journals such as Church History and Journal of Ecclesiastical History. He's the author of two books, I think one of which is outside, as well as some of Dr. Houston's books. Uh, one of uh, Bruce's titles is John Newton and the English uh, Evangelical Tradition. The other title is the Evangelical Conversion Narrative. Bruce has received numerous teaching awards, research grants, fellowships. He's uh, been the Mayor's Research Fellow at the Huntington Library uh, and holder of the Henry Luce Theological Fellowship and he currently researches in evangelical spirituality. Bruce and his wife uh, have three children, and I bet you don't have any grandchildren or great-grandchildren quite yet. But It's a pleasure to have these gentlemen with us. They just uh, got done speaking to um, our fellows up at the, the Center for Christian Thought, and it was just a, a, a rich, uh, deep time, and so I'm excited to kind of carry on that conversation with you all. So, Bruce, I'll ask you to come first. Thank you. Yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you and to talk to Christian leaders and to pastors. And our topic uh, for the luncheon today is the rise, decline, and recovery of the human soul. And just as by way of introduction, I get the middle bit to do with the decline of the human soul. That's the story. I get to tell the bad news. And um, 
And how did we get from the sacred Christian soul uh, to the modern self? What are some of the implications of that? And then uh, Jim will talk more about the recovery of the human soul. As you and I go about our daily lives, participating in the modern world, driving a car, checking our email or posting a status update on Facebook, warming up coffee in the microwave, reading a newspaper online, buying our groceries, voting in the election for the local school board, or attending a pastor's luncheon. As we do these everyday things, we are receiving, maybe all unawares, a kind of catechism about what it is to be a human being. There is an implied anthropology, an implied anthropology in these very ordinary conditions of modern life. And it is written in letters almost too large to read. Rapid transportation, long distance communication, powerful technology, a ubiquitous media, the consumer economy, urban diversity and anonymity, democratic politics, these and other taken for granted features of modern life on the ground speak to us of the human being as mobile, capable, resourceful, self-contained, sovereign, rational, and agentle, that is, the maker of choices, perhaps above all. These are some of the forms of modern life that shape the way we think about what it is to be human. As we engage in um, ministry and in leadership, this can all unawares shape us. But in addition to these forms, there's also the messages of modern life that speak to us all the time, and more overtly about the nature of human beings. The combined effect of the form and the messages of the modern world is, I think, to drain anthropology of any sense of transcendence. What is the nature of the human person? It seems to be drained of a sense of transcendence. If we are not reflective as Christian leaders and pastors, this will be the anthropology subtly at work in our sermons, our counseling, our planning, our leadership, our enterprise. We may find ourselves, that is to say, unconsciously addressing compact modern selves rather than infinitely sacred souls. This is a tragedy. The modern self is a shrunken, shriveled version of the Christian soul. Eugene Peterson says with characteristic simplicity, the self is the soul without God. How did we arrive here? What's the kind of genealogy? How did we get from the soul to the self? It's a long story, and it involves both the emergence of these modern social conditions and the history of ideas. And it's helpful, I think, sometimes to get the genealogy. It helps you see the things which are otherwise invisible. One could trace a longer history of the naturalization of the soul, but I would begin the story in the 17th and 18th centuries, in the early modern West, the social conditions changed gradually. It was not the internet then, but the periodical press that was the powerful, first powerful modern media. It was not travel by car and jet airplane that made us mobile, but turnpike roads and the merchant marine. It was not democratic politics, but the slow expansion of the franchise, of the vote to more and more people. It was not the advanced religious pluralism of today, but it was the first constitutional guarantees of limited religious toleration that began to shape how people think. It was not multiculturalism and globalization, but the beginning of large-scale people migrations and a transatlantic exchange of people and goods. It was not Coca-Cola, but Wedgwood pottery. And on the story goes. Slowly, the modern world was built from the bottom up. And the conditions that shape our imagination of what it is to be a human being changed along with it. One example of how this cashes out is what Jürgen Habermas uh, said. He argued that the periodical press and long distance trade fostered what he called, I think nicely, a new audience-oriented subjectivity. Audience-oriented subjectivity. I understand myself, that is to say, not fundamentally as a person in relationship with other persons in face-to-face -face communion of persons of trust and intimacy and so on, but I understand myself more routinely as someone displaying myself to an audience. If that was true in the 18th century with newspapers and more communication at a distance, 
how much more so today with the rise of an all-encompassing social media. Think of the phrase audience-oriented subjectivity and Facebook, and you know what I mean. So social conditions changed on the ground and created what G.K. Chesterton has called the modern heresy. The huge modern heresy, said Chesterton, is to alter the human soul to fit modern social conditions instead of altering modern social conditions to fit the human soul. So as this is taking place on the ground, there is a set of parallel reductions going on in the world of ideas. So we can go from below or from above. Let me suggest five of these reductions that appear just at the beginning of early modern thought. that are still dominant messages that we hear in various ways today. First, there's the reduction of the sacred, infinitely sacred human soul to the thinking self. I am a person fundamentally who is rational and thinking. You see this in the philosophy of Rene Descartes, whose method of radical doubt led him to the one indubitable rock of certainty that he could not doubt that he was doubting. I judged, he said, that nothing could that I could unhesitatingly accept. Sorry, I judged that I could unhesitatingly accept it as the first principle of the philosophy I was seeking. The first principle, this is the reduction, this is the bedrock, I'm a thinking self. Is that still operating in our world today? I think in many spheres it is. Do we address people in our pews as fundamentally heads on a stick, rational uh, thinkers? Secondly, there's the reduction of the sacred human soul to the sovereign self. We see this in the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, who made each individual being a kind of sovereign state over which he or she had the rights of an absolute ruler. The human being is fundamentally the bearer of legal rights. The right of nature, he said, is the liberty each man hath to use his own power as he will himself for the preservation of his own nature, of doing anything which in his own judgment and reason he shall conceive to be the aptest means thereunto. Primarily, I am a person who is the bearer of rights, beginning with my body. The thinking self, the sovereign self. Thirdly, there's the reduction of the sacred human soul, the infinitely sacred human soul, to the empirical self, the self that may be observed in any given moment. You see this in the philosophy of John Locke and David Hume, who could only regard the human person as the sum of our conscious perceptions in the present moment. Uh, just a cutting of ourselves in present observation. So Hume wrote that the person is nothing, quote, but a bundle or collection of different perceptions which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in perpetual flux and movement. It's like the later philosopher William James talking about perception as a blooming, buzzing confusion. Just a bundled self, an empirical self. Fourthly, there's the reduction of the sacred human soul, the infinitely sacred human soul, to the choosing self. You see this in the philosophy of Francis Hutchinson and the third Earl of Shaftesbury, who conceived of the human person as fundamentally the one who makes moral choices, who acts on the world through the power of individual choice and private judgment. Hutchinson said, he acts reasonably, who considers various actions in his power, forms true opinions of their tendency, and chooses to do that which will obtain the highest degree of that to which the instincts of his nature incline him. I am fundamentally an agent, fundamentally the one who makes choices. And fifthly, and related to this, is the last reduction of the sacred human soul to the economic self in the philosophy of Adam Smith, for whom the human person was fundamentally self-interested, seeking to advance his or her material condition through rational economic calculation just in preparation for Black Friday. <laughs> it is not, he says, from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner. It's not because they're fundamentally gifting us with something, but we get our dinner from their regard to their own interest in trade. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. The natural effort of every individual to better his own condition when suffered to exert itself with freedom and security is so powerful a principle that it is alone capable of carrying on the society 
to wealth and prosperity. So there's just five little cuttings from intellectual history that give you a sense of this reduction of the soul to the self. Five reductions in early modern thought. And we could carry the story on into our own times. In particular, Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, the so-called masters of suspicion of the 19th century, have done much to intensify the alienation of the self in later modern and postmodern thought. But just think for a moment how dangerous for pastoral ministry and Christian leadership it is today if we succumb to any of these reductions. Viewing the people around us merely as compact, self-contained, resourceful, rational agents, rather than as they are, creatures made in God's image and intended for his likeness, able to commune with the God of the universe, capable of God and meant to share in his eternal glory, to stand forever upright in the presence of eternal glory. These are some of the reductions that have led from the soul to the self. Feel a bit like a warm-up act. I turn things over now to Jim who will point us to the deeper resources in scripture and in the Christian tradition for the recovery of the human soul today. Yeah. Mm -hmm.